Hello and welcome to this 4.6 kilometer entertainment route which goes through the West End of London. This is a combination of three of the four entertainment runs which I've done before but this puts them all together as one long run. So I hope you really enjoy it. The route as I said is about 4.6 kilometers long and the best time to do this would be first thing on a weekend morning preferably a Sunday when there's no one around and the sights look at their best with the sunlight and the crowds are not there at all and also it's great for your pocket. So let's give you a brief overview of the runs that we cover. So the ones that we're going to to look at is we're going to look at the route starting at Covent Garden and then we will go down towards Piccadilly and then we'll go from Piccadilly, Chinatown, Soho, up to Cambridge Circus, back to Leicester Square and then I've put in an extra route which brings us from Leicester Square back to Covent Garden through the Royal Opera House and then we do the theatre route which will go through Covent Garden and then out through the Aldwych along the Strand and then finish up at Trafalgar Square. Now the four main routes that I want to go through, the first one we'll be looking at is from Covent Garden to Piccadilly Circus and this really is the start of cinemas and theatres as a combination of the two there but also starting off with one of the first areas developed in the 17th century. The format that I'll be doing will be giving you an overview of the area then I will show you what that particular run would look like as if you were doing it at speed and then I'll go back and look at the individual sites along the way. Next part before we get into the detail is I'm going to look at the history of the entertainment areas of London. Now this is quite interesting when you look at how London used to look going back in time. Now, there's a phrase by W.H. Auden which says that in order to know a country, you have to live in two others. But sometimes in order to know London, you have to live in two different eras of London. And the two that I've chosen are the Tudor Age, which is Queen Elizabeth the first time, Henry the Eighth time. And the second one is in the Victorian times. So that would be about 1850 when Charles Dickens was also around. So we have Shakespeare and we have Charles Dickens. But I've also put the Stuarts in the middle for King Charles II, the king who brought back partying, because he's in some respects responsible for the development of the entertainment district of London. So let's see what London looked like in the 16th century. You can see that London is quite well contained with inside its city walls, And there's a London bridge, it's the one you see in the middle, and that is Southwark. And that's all London was. Now at the time, there wasn't all that many people. So you're really talking about 70,000 people living in London in about 1500. And that moved up to 700,000 by the time you got to the Stuarts. And by the time you got to Victorians, it had expanded to about 2.6 million people. Now, if we also look, we've got places like St. Giles and we've got Kensington and we've got Marabones and you can see there's nothing there at all. So London was really self-contained. The whole of the West End and the Entertainment District is not even on the map. And that's quite clear if we have a look at this slightly later map. You can see Covent Garden is in fact just fields and that was because this was actually owned by the church. And at the time of this map's creation... Henry VIII had become independent from the Catholic Church and he was taking back the lands and the monies from the monastic areas around London. And this would have been one of the first development areas for the entertainment industry. Now, if we have a look at this map from 1560, I've plotted the roots of some of the photo runs as best as I can ascertain them. And you can see that they are really just in the middle of the country. Now we look at those in a bit more detail as we go forward. But as we start to move out towards the Victorian times, you can see that London is completely built up. Now this map is turned the other way around. So this is the River Thames down in here and this is the north. And this is 
Piccadilly Circus. Uh, this is the start at Covent Garden, and that's Trafalgar Square. But you can see that the whole aspect about how London is put together is very similar to what it is today. The only real exception is the second part of the run when we go through Shaftesbury Avenue, because that would have not have been built at this time. That will give you a good overview to most of the entertainment areas in London. I do another route which actually goes from Covent Garden all the way up to Tottenham Court Road through St. Giles, but I haven't included it on this set of runs. But that is also the entertainment areas. But also that has a slightly different history to the other areas that we've been talking about here. OK, so we're going to start on the first of these runs, which will be from Covent Garden to Piccadilly Circus. Now, as I said before, what I'll do is I'll show you what the run looks like first, then I'll come back and show you the history and some of the sites that are along the way. I think that's an easier way of, of showing how this area is put together. So we'll start off by having a look at the map itself that we're going to cover. We're going to start from Covent Garden, which is here, and basically just do one complete route, with this, which is only 0.8 of a kilometre long, all the way down to Piccadilly Circus. So it's going to be one of the most simplest navigational runs that we have in this particular series. But you'll see that it covers quite a few interesting areas along the way and it really charts the development of some of the entertainment growth as it moves from east to west. Now let's start with the run itself. We're going to do this at speed and we start just outside Covent Garden tube station and just show the map here and we go along Long Acre and along here we've got St. Giles off to the right-hand side. We've got Cambridge Theatre and Seven Dials, which is worth a look. We've got Stanford Bookshops, which used to just look at London maps. Then we're at St. Martin's Lane. And then we get towards Charing Cross and Leicester Square. That's Charing Cross Road. Then we're into Leicester Square itself with all the cinemas and uh, Leicester Square, which has got hotels and other places to visit. Then we've got... Towards the end, we've got the M&M, Lego and W Hotel. Then we get to Wardour Street and Chinatown. And then we move towards Coventry Street with the Trocadero. Then we get to the Criterion Building. And then we end up finally at Piccadilly Circus. So that's about 0.8 of a kilometre. And I think you'll find it a very interesting and easy route to get yourself started. OK, what we're going to do next is that we're going to give a guided tour of the key sites along the way. I'm going to do this by showing you 360 pictures of certain areas along the route. This will give you an idea about what the area looks like, but it'll also allow me to show you the main sites. OK, so here we are just outside Covent Garden tube station. Now, just to give you a spin you all the way around. So this you would likely to be coming out of this entrance here. That's normally the entrance to go into it. We have Long Acre going down this direction, which we're going to look at. This is the route that we're going to finish off when we go down towards uh, Trafalgar Square and the theatre routes in that direction. Uh, this goes down towards Hoban, and this route, if we went down there, would take you down to the St. Giles route and to Topham Court Road, which is one of the other runs that we go on. So if we have a look at what the area looked like in 1560... And just uh, blow this out a little bigger. You can see it's a, just a straight route going from Covent Garden Station. And that's where Leicester Square Station would have been. And it goes to Piccadilly Station, Piccadilly Station, which is just off the map. And that's Trafalgar Square, as we see down in here. It would have just gone along the edge of Long Acre, which I'll talk about in a second. And in this Covent Garden Market, which was a market run by the monasteries to give food to Westminster Abbey, which is further down to the southwest here. Now, this would have been a, an orchard originally, but we'll just move on and go back and have a look at how this has changed as we go through time. Now, what actually happened within the area is we get to about the 1690s, so 100 years later, the area has been 
fairly well developed. Now, this is a plan looking at Covent Garden, but it looks at it from St. Paul's Church, which is just around here. Now, this was a parish church, so it's a parish map showing you all the houses within inside that particular area. Now, this area was originally given to John Russell, who was the Duke of Bedford, and he was given it by Henry VIII in 1540, basically taking the land off the church and giving it to John Russell. Now, what he built, he built the Long Acre, but he didn't do much in the way of development, and it wasn't until 1625 when Charles I, and he was the one who got his head chopped off, complained that there were too many potholes in the area. But we couldn't develop this part of London because in the Elizabethan time, they'd basically put a three-mile exclusion zone around London, partly to provide a barrier for the plague, but also to protect against development which might usurp the Queen, who was Queen Elizabeth at the time. But he was able to build as much land as he wanted for a sum of £2,000. And this is basically what he built. Now, if we go back and look at how the area changed a little bit later, so if we have a look at the route in 1840, so we're now in Victorian times, you can see, this is the other way around, but Covent Garden's now on this side and Piccadilly Circus is down in here. A lot of the route has been built up very much as we know it today. Uh, if you went down this route, it would be a similar line in terms of the route obviously things would be a lot different but we'd start off at this point and we'd end up at Piccadilly Circus anyway we'll be looking at these maps in more detail later now let's just just go through and uh, give you some views of Long Acre itself so as we've discussed we'll give an idea about how it developed over time one of the more interesting things about Long Acre it was a route going from this part of London all the way out towards Bath so this would have gone straight out towards Piccadilly and then straight out towards Hyde Park and towards Bath and Bristol. This area was made famous for coach building and there were in fact 41 sites of coach builders along this route and as you can see these arches here would probably have represented what those coach building factories would have. But it also did have some links to the entertainment so there was a Queen's Theatre just near Covent Garden going back this way and there, obviously, there's the Cambridge Theatre in Seven Dials to the right. There was also John Bird, who was involved in television, set up a office here. There's Pineapple Studios for dancing. There's the London Film School, as well as the Royal Ballet towards the other end of Covent Garden. OK, so let's move down now towards St Martin's in the field. Now, we're going to come and look at this area in a bit more detail on the way back. Uh, but we're basically just coming down this road in here and we're just going to continue along towards Charing Cross Road and Leicester Square. So let's do that and then we'll just touch on this particular area very briefly. Uh, so this is where we've just come through. Uh, this is a hippodrome and the tube station which we'll look at. But we'll go directly into Leicester Square. So this is Leicester Square with the square in the middle and the cinemas on the outside. If we talk about Leicester Square itself, we've got a number of cinemas such as the View down here. We've got the Odeon Leicester Square, as you can see. As we go around in here, we've got the Empire Cinema, and there's a number of cinemas towards the back end as well. Around here we have the actual Leicester Square itself and just a little bit of history about this one. Again, it goes back to Henry VIII. But this was actually given to Robert Sidney, the second Earl of Leicester, hence the word Leicester Square. And this area in the middle was in fact common land, which was used for grazing of sheep. Uh, it was called Leicester Fields at the time. And it has remained the square ever since despite a number of disputes that have happened to try to build on it the houses were built around the square for the rich and famous at the time but as with a lot of areas of London as the entertainment industry moved in the residents moved out and the whole area was given over towards entertainment so you had in 19th centuries music halls as well as hotels coming up 
in this area. And in the 20th century, those music halls and theatres were replaced with cinemas. So, for example, the Alhambra Theatre, which was sat in here, uh, became the Odeon in 1937. And then the Empire Theatre, which was here, became a cinema in 1920. The View, which is over here, was the Daily Theatre, and that became Warner Brothers in 1937. So this would be the nearest thing that we would get to a Hollywood centre for the UK, but it's more a historic centre with the theatres and the cinemas. But in its day, it would have been a massive centre for entertainment, being at the heart of the British Empire, especially during Victorian times. A bit further along, we can see we have a very smart-looking building here, which is both the W Hotel as well as the M&M Shop building on the other side is a Lego center and in the middle we have a glockenspiel and the reason we have that is that this building on our left used to be the Swiss center and a glockenspiel has 27 bells and 11 figures as well as a clock. Now the road that we see going up here is Waldorf Street and this road goes all the way up to Oxford Street through Soho as well as all the way down towards Pall Mall. What we're going to go along is Coventry Street and Coventry Street if we have a look at some of the pictures here we can see that it's got a number of eating houses as well as theatres and the Trocadero but we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail so we'll, we'll come up the street past the Trocadero and then end up at the Haymarket which is what I just want to look at in a bit more detail. Before we look at the Criterion building in front of us, we're just going to swing around and have a look at Coventry Street. Now, Coventry Street was given to Henry Coventry by Charles II to develop as an entertainment district, which would include gambling, nightclubs, theatres and other events. And as you can see, we have the Prince Edward Theatre here. And we'll have a look at the theatres in a bit more detail in a second. But you'll also see that the Trocadero which is opposite the theatre, was built in 1896 and it was built on the original site of the Argyle Rooms, which was a notorious place for prostitutes and other forms of activity at the time. It was put together as a restaurant by Jay Lyons, who was known for his tea shops at the time, but he built it in a very Baroque style with grand staircases and long bars and it, it lasted all the way up until about 1984. And then it became a entertainment venue. And I think today it has houses, something called the Crystal Maze. Now if we swing around a little bit down in here, we're down towards the Haymarket. So we've got the Criterion building in front of us. And then we've got the Haymarket and the Haymarket Theatre down towards the bottom. Now this was a entertainment area for the Victorians and the Georgians. We have the Theatre Royal, which dates from 1720, the third oldest in London. We've got Her Majesty's Theatre, which was built in 1705. And then we also have the Prince Edward Theatre, which we've just talked about, which is quite new in 1930. And then we have the Harold Pinter one in 1881. Now, the building we see in front of us, which is the Criterion Building, was built in 1873. And you'll see that at the bottom there is some horses and at the top are three figures. So these are the horses of Helius and the daughters of Helius. And Helius was the personification of the sun in Greek mythology. And the horses pulled the chariot across the sky. And the three daughters of Helius were splendor, good character and festivities, which is very fitting for this area. Now, the building itself dates back to 1873, and it was built by a theatre architect called Thomas Verity in what is called Neo-Byzantine style. And in 2015, it was noted in the Huffington Post as being the top 10 historical restaurants in the world. For those who are used to playing Monopoly, you may have also noticed that in this particular route, we do cover the yellow cards on the Monopoly board, that being Leicester Square, 
£260, Coventry Street £260 and Piccadilly £280. Okay, so let's move along and get to the end of this particular route. So this section of the run ends at Piccadilly Circus outside the Shaftesbury Memorial, which a lot of people will know as Eros, but is in fact Antiros, who is the brother of Eros and is the god of unrequited love. The actual angel is known as the Angel of Christianity and is on what is called the Shaftesbury Memorial. This was the first aluminium sculpture at the time, and it was dedicated to the philosopher Lord Shaftesbury, who did a lot of work in reforming the mines, child labour and lunacy laws during the Victorian period. The next thing to notice is the lights at Piccadilly Circus, which have been there since 1908, and the first advert was for Perrier. They used to go all the way round, but now they're just on the northwest corner. But these signs have had a lot of links to both drink, such as Guinness, Fossers and Coke, as well as to electronics, such as Samsung and Canon. They've only been switched off twice. One was for the funeral of Winston Churchill and the other one was for Diana, the Princess of Wales, when she died. And just next to the lights, we have the London Pavilion, which was originally built in 1859, uh, became a cinema in 1934 and now is the Ripley Believe It or Not exhibition, as well as the Body Works. The second part of this run goes from Piccadilly Circus to Leicester Square and this will go via Chinatown, Soho, as well as Theatreland. Now just to give you a view of the route we're going to take, this is slightly more complicated, there's a few more turns to look out for. We start just where we left off at Piccadilly Circus but we go at the side of the neon lights, the right hand side of those, up Shaftesbury Avenue, all the way up until we get to the uh, Queen's Theatre. We'll turn down into Chinatown, do a small section of Chinatown, then come back up into Soho via Old Compton Street, and then we'll come to the Palace Theatre, which is Cambridge Circus, and then follow the Charing Cross Road down to Leicester Square. So the distance again is about a kilometre. Again, best time is always to do this first thing in the morning. Now, as we did before, we're just going to go and show you the route before we do the sights. So we start the run looking at the lights right in front of us, and then we go up Shaftesbury Avenues with the lights on our left-hand side, keep on going up this road, be passing a number of theatres along here. This is, in a sense, theatre land, which we'll talk about later. Once you pass about the third theatre, we're looking for Les Mis, we'll be turning right down towards Chinatown and then we'll turn left down to Gerrard Street and we'll go through the arches of Chinatown. As we get to the next turning, we're going to turn left and then come out of Chinatown, just cross Shaftesbury Avenue, which we've just been on before, and then we'll be on Dean Street and we'll just go all the way up to Dean Street until we hit Old Compton street and then we'll turn right and then we'll be heading down there and uh, you'll see that we'll have the Prince Edward Theatre on our left hand side and we'll have the three greyhounds on our right and in between the uh, Ed's Diner we go down a small little cobbled alleyway and then we're right in Cambridge Circus and this is Charing Cross Road in here and we just turn right basically there um, with the Prince's Theatre on our Palace Theatre on our right and we keep on coming down this road, which is all full of bookshops, old second-hand bookshops, until we get down to Leicester Square. And uh, that will be the tour, really, of this part of London. So we just stop here, just outside Leicester Square on Charing Cross Road, and we're just ready then to start the guided tour. Now, we'll be using the 360 views as we did last time and very similar to what you we started off from the previous run you can see in front of us we have the lights and then we have the London pavilion in front of us and then we're ready to go 
So in order of age, the oldest area in this part of the London is Soho, which dates from 1680. Then we have Regent Street, which is the other side on one of the shopping runs, the two white buildings. That dates from 1819. Then we have Shaftesbury Avenue, which we're just going to go up, which dates from 1886. Then we have the lights here, which date from 1911, 1908. And we're going to have a look at how this route looked like in going back in time. If we look at the map from 1560, we can see that it starts really all in the countryside. It would have been completely in the countryside. I've just sketched out how it would have looked going into Soho itself through Leicester Fields and then coming back down to where Leicester Square tube station would be. And if you look at the map from 1850, you'll see that the route that we're going to travel on, a lot of it hasn't even been developed. So this was semi-slum sort of areas. There was no real direct route. And we show it going through what used to be the old route to start off with then it sort of comes back and starts going to Jerry Street which was there goes through some of the roads that were in Soho and then comes back towards Charing Cross and Leicester Square but again these roads weren't even built so we wouldn't have been able to go along this route in 1850 we would have needed to wait for Shaftesbury Avenue to be built so let's go along and go up Shaftesbury Avenue so this is Shaftesbury Avenue looking upwards and this is looking down the road towards Piccadilly Circus. Now this would have been probably the next route for town planning. There was a successful development in Regent Street which basically divided the poorer east part of London where we're in now from the richer west side in Mayfair by removing Swallow Streets and clearing out the slums and making it all gentrified. A similar sort of process happened here. It removed the slams, it gentrified the area, it improved traffic, and it brought business and quality entertainment to the area. And this was repeated throughout London, so you'll see that this particular route goes from Regent Street all the way up into New Bond Street. It provided pavements, which were a lot wider than the existing streets, and it gave a great thoroughfare for traffic. The architect behind this was Joseph Bazalgette, who was responsible for the Victorian embankment. And he started this in 1877, as part of the Department of Works. And other works included uh, Farringdon, Victoria Street, towards Westminster, as well as New Oxford Street. And for those in Harry Potter, which will be a bit of a theme on this one, there is in the film Deathly Hallows, he flees the Death Eaters just at the bottom of Shaftesbury Avenue. OK, we're going to go up a bit further towards the turning to go down towards Chinatown. But before we do, just on our right hand side, you can't really see it in here, but there is St. Anne's Church. This was built in 1686 and became the parish church for this area because of the expansion of London. Uh, this is also Wardour Street, which we mentioned earlier. It goes all the way from Leicester Square all the way up to Oxford Street along the top. And... Just going back to St. Anne's Church, it was called St. Anne's because Bishop Henry Compton was the tutor of the future wife of James I, who was called Anne, and hence why we have Old Compton Street, which we'll get to later. Now, when we look at theatres, for which there are lots, there are about 35 in London, and they do provide a lot of revenue. And in this particular area, we have the Apollo, we have the Gilgood, we have the Lyric and the Queen's. I'll just take a moment to discuss theatre land a little bit. So in the city of London, all theatres tend to be outside the city wall. So originally it started off in Curtain Street, which is to the north. Then they moved down to, in 1599 to the Globe, Shakespeare's Globe, which we see by Millennium Bridge. But after the fire of London in 1666, a lot of the city of London was burnt down and people started to move out to the west. And with that came the entertainment industry we had a period from 1649 to 1660 where we had a bit of a republic experiment when Charles I managed to got his head chopped off by Oliver Cromwell. But it was all rescued when Charles II came back, the king who brought back partying 
and he started to build up the whole of the entertainment district of London. Now, at the time, you didn't have much in the way of theatre. It was tend to be groups of players who produced plays either locally in London and moved around or around the, the country. Queen Elizabeth I and Charles II were really keen on theatre and there was a growing population of London. So in Victorian times, you had something like 2.6 million, which grew from 700,000. And therefore, it was big business to build theatres. So they do look as if they're part of the scenery. They are very ornate inside, but they are cramped. And they did have the, the structure of galleries at the top for the poor people, boxes for the rich in the middle, and the pit at the bottom for basically everybody else who could afford it. Okay, so we're going to turn down into Chinatown, uh, which basically consists of Waldorf Street going all the way down to Leicester Square, as well as Gerrard Street, which we'll look at as being the two main streets. It's been there since about the 1970s. It was historically in Limehouse, in the docks, towards Canary Wharf, but because of the decline of the docks and bombing during the Second World War, it moved here in 1972, and there is about 43 different restaurants around the area. Jarrah Street has been around for many years because it used to have taverns and coffee houses and restaurants to look after the new residents in Leicester Square. And in fact, Mr. Gerrard's from Great Expectations and Charles Dickens is based in this location. The Club 43, which is a, a notorious nightclub from the Roaring Twenties, was also located in this position. Now, coming out of Chinatown, we go across Shaftesbury Avenue again, and we end up at the beginnings of Soho, actually onto Old Compton Street, as we see here. Now, this is the main east to west route going through Soho, but on each of the streets, we have Greek Street further up, we have Dean Street, and we have First Street, all have their own individual characters of Soho, which we'll look at Soho in a bit more detail in another video. But again, this area was developed in Henry VIII's time, but as a royal park, because this would have been the first part of the hunt. And the word Soho comes from a hunting cry at the start of hunt, and apparently they used to say Soho, or something similar, to start the hunt, probably before they had horns. The area was developed after 1666 by Henry German, who also developed German Street. And originally, again, it was built for the rich and the up-and-coming classes, but after the Great Fire of London, it needed to accommodate more people. And by 1750, the rich had moved west. The area had become famous for retail and entertainment, and there'd been a, quite a large influx of immigrants from France with the Huguenots who were protestants who were being persecuted there and the area slowly went downhill there was lots of the bigger houses became tenement blocks where the house was rented but it was sub rented into different apartments and then the floors were had their own set of rents and then the rooms and it became smaller and smaller but very compact and you even had people like Karl Marx living here from 1849 in 28 Dean Street but moving on, we're just going to move towards the east now, going past the Prince Edward Theatre, which was built in the 1930s for Edward VIII, who was the Duke of Windsor, but he was also our 20th century king who abdicated. So the theatre became a, a music hall and a cinema, as well as a casino, but it's now back again as the theatre. And then we just turn in between the diner and the three greyhounds, towards Cambridge Circus. Now, it's called the Three Greyhounds because this was uh, an area for hunting and they used to like hair coursing in this particular part of London. So we're now in Cambridge Circus outside the Palace Theatre where Harry Potter, the Cursed Child, is being shown. This was put together by Doyle Cart, who was a theatre manager and made famous for his running of the Gilbert and Sullivan plays. It was originally meant as an opera house, but became a theatre and there's been plays such as 
Jesus Christ Superstar, Les Mis is shown in there, Spam a lot, and now we have Harry Potter. In the Harry Potter books, there is a pub called the Leaky Cauldron, which was placed in Charing Cross Road, which is this road which goes all the way from north to south. But it doesn't appear in the films. That seems to show it in Borough Market or Leadenhall, depending on which film you're looking for. However, in the Half-Blood Prince, when the Millennium Bridge gets destroyed, the Death Eaters do zoom across London and go down Diagon Alley, which is just off Leicester Square Station, which we'll see at the last part of the run. Now, there are pubs which you could say have leaking cauldron-type properties. The one I like is the two near Shandos Place, which are the, the Harp and the Marquess. That's right near the narrowest alley in London, called Bridges Place, and that almost gives you the sense of apparating as you end up coming out onto St. Martin's Lane. Back in the real world, we'll end up at Leicester Square, where we have two things to finish off. One is the Hippodrome in front of us, which refers to a place of entertainment where horse racing was staged. And as you can see, there are some horses at the top of the building. It was built in 1900 as a variety performance and has been a theatre until 1951. Then it was the talk of the town in the 70s. It was an event space in the 80s and it's a casino today. The other building on the other side of the road is the Wyndham Theatre. And this was developed by Charles Wyndham, who was not only a surgeon, but a theatre manager. And he's built this relatively small theatre next to Leicester Square Tube Station, which, when it was first built, was actually called Cranbourne Station in 1906. But in 1935, it was revamped to convert it to escalators and called Leicester Square. And if you go down there, you'll see some fill sprockets on the tiles. Okay, so that ends the second part. Now we're just going to go on the last two, which take us from which take us from Leicester Square to Covent Garden, and then from Covent Garden to Trafalgar Square. We'll be doubling back on some parts of the route that we've done before, but only for a short period. And just as we sort of see the map from here, we're just going to go back from Leicester Square to St Martin's Lane, and then we're going to go down Garrick Street down towards King Street. This will bring us directly into Covent Garden. We're not going to stay there very long. We're just going to go to the end and then come out into Bow Street, really to just show you two main other sites in here. One's going to be the Royal Opera House and the other one would be Bow Street's Magistrate Courts, a bit of a history around that part of London. And then we'll come back to Covent Garden Station, ready for the last leg. So that's what we'll be seeing. And as before, we'll just go and take you on a a quick photo run at speed. This route is only about 0.9 of a kilometre, so again, a very short one. Again, it's always best to do this first thing in the morning. And this is what the route will look like. So with the tube station in front of us, we're just going to continue down between the two tube station entrances. And then as we get to the next junction, which will be around St. Martin's Lane and Long Acre will be right in front of you. And this is actually going to take us into Garrick Street. And the first building that we see is the Garrick Club on our right hand side. And we've got Floral Street on our left. And then as we get halfway up the street, we've got a a pub, but we're going to turn left into King Street. And this will bring us just at the side of Covent Garden so Covent Garden will now be on our right hand side we've got the Apple store on our left and we just keep on keep on going until we get to the end and we just turn right and then first left and then this will bring us on to Bow Street we turn left into Bow Street and this will bring us up past the Royal Opera House on our right hand side and it will also bring us past the Bow Street Magistrate or Court on our left as soon as we pass that and we take a very sharp left-hand turn. So we've got the Opera House on our left. We just go down that floral street till we get to the end and the first turn in on our right. So we're back in Covent Garden. We turn right and we'll just be outside the tube station and that's where it ends. Okay, so now we want to go and have a look at some of the sights along the route. 
Okay, so this is the 360 view, very similar to what we saw last time. And I'm just pointing you in the direction of where we're going up towards St. Martin's Lane. So if you remember when we first started the tour, we actually came down this route and across the road into Leicester Square. But we're just going to go back along between these two entrances to the station towards St. Martin's Lane. Now, when we first went through this, I originally just skipped over this part. But I just want to just cover this now. So we're at a almost like a five way junction here on our left hand side as we're looking at this now there's St Martin's Lane which is going down left past Bella Italia in Garrick Street so this is St Martin's Lane and across there is Upper St Martin's Lane now if we look at this this actually goes from Trafalgar Square going north and this would have been one of the main routes going north before Charing Cross Road was built so it was originally in place at about 1610 and the main things I just want to draw your attention to is that, again, it has a number of theatres. So we do have theatres such as the Duke of York and the Noel Cow Theatre just along, this, along that street. But we also have the English National Opera uh, Coliseum Theatre, which is just at the bottom near St. Martin's Lane or St. Martin's Church. Across the road from this junction, there is another theatre called the Arts Theatre. And for those who are interested in Harry Potter, at the end of this street is the little alleyway that, at the beginning of the Half-Blood Prince, when the Millennium Bridge was destroyed, that's where the Death Eaters zipped up. But we're actually going to just take you a little trip up to the northern part, or upper St. Martin's Lane, which will actually bring you into St. Giles, because there you have the Ivy restaurant, which is probably one of the most expensive or exclusive restaurants in London. It started in 1917 and it was mainly focused on arts and the media. And there is a hidden entrance to the Ivy Club with a special third floor rooftop view. However, you can experience some of the magic of the Ivy with several Ivy brasseries around, which have similar styles and and taste, but a more accessible price. And there's one in Covent Garden, should you be interested. There is also one of the longest running theatre performances at St. Martin's Theatre called The Mousetrap. This has had over 25,000 performances and was originally put together for Queen Mary, who was the wife of George V in 1952, based on an Agatha Christie story. Now, this is now, this is based on a true case about a foster care abuse of a young boy called Dennis O'Neill. It's a true story, but the ending in the particular play is not revealed at all. So when you go and see it, it's a part of keeping that secret. The other theatre nearby there is called the Ambassador Theatre. OK, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go along the route that we intend to do from here which is really just to go down Garrick Street. The thing that I want to point out to you is the Garrick Club which is just on the right hand side so it's not particularly difficult to miss because it is quite an old building formed in 1831 and this is a gentleman's club or a private social club which is focused on the patronage of drama. Originally its members came from peers of the realm, there were writers, there were actors musicians and publishers but it does focus on the literary society and supporters of drama and it includes a theatrical library as well as looking at the costumes of the theatre. There's a lot of famous names including Henry Irving, Laurence Olivier, Stephen Fry, John Gilgood, some British actors there as well as writers such as H.G. Wells and A.A. A. Milnes who was famous for Winnie the Pooh. It's called the Garrick Club after actor, playwright, producer and theatre manager called David Garrick who lived from the 1700s. A bit further along the street, the next thing to do, slightly different, uh, you'll come across a an alleyway. So if I just turn a bit to the left hand side in here, you'll see a small pub up there called The Lamb and the Flag. And the reason I'm just stopping there is because of the bare knuckle fights, prize fights that used to go on there. And with a nickname called the Bucket of Blood, you can probably understand what was going on there. 
Now what is also interesting is that there's a little alleyway in between here and that is where the poet John Dryden was attacked by, in a sense, Charles II's hitmen for a satirical poem that he wrote about one of Charles II's mistresses called Louise. So we're going to just continue down through Covent Garden, down King Street, not stopping too much along here, um, and then we'll just go past the entrance, which we're going to come back down to shortly, past the Apple Store, just go to the end, and we're just going to continue this until we through to Russell Street, until we get to Bow Street Junction, because at this particular point, I just want to talk about two other areas in here. One's called the Royal Opera House and Bow Street Magistrate Court. So this is a quite a bit of a whistle-stop tour, this one. So when we get to the Royal Opera House, there's two contrasting images here. On the left-hand side, we have the wonderful Royal Opera House, which was instigated originally again by Charles II in 1732, but it burnt down twice in 1808 and 1856. And so this building dates back from 1858. The atrium is called the Paul Hanley Hall, and it is the home for the Royal Ballet and Opera. It was originally called the Theatre Royal, but it changed its name in 1892 to the Royal Opera House. Now, the auditorium here is, is massive. It can hold up to 2,250 people. And although we sometimes think that opera is expensive, they do have tickets ranging from £4 to 200 not so many at £4. But the prices can be seen as being comparable to what you might pay at a top-rate football match. Now, the thing about opera and probably also about football really is that it engages all your senses so you can see it you can feel it you can hear it and that sort of atmosphere can really set off all the senses and enhance your enjoyment so it's exciting it's dramatic and it also has some sunny spells during the performance generally again quite similar to both football and British weather but if you do get a chance to go to an opera especially one like this I would recommend it however I would suggest that you first know the story so you can at least follow it on the, along the way and you don't get too overwhelmed now turning to the right we then have something quite a bit different because in front of us in this quite austere building here is the Bow Street Magistrates Court now within inside this area of London it we had our first police force called the Bow Street Runners. Now the reason we had it is because this was quite a big area of entertainment but there was a quite a number of gym palaces and that brought a lot of crime with a thievings, large-scale prostitution and there was drunkenness all in the area and the people who ran the theatres wanted to clean up the area so they instigated the first police force now, we need to just understand a little bit about policing at the time. Before the police were there, if you wanted to arrest someone, you needed to do it for yourself. Now, there were things like bounty hunters around where you could go and catch a criminal, such as a highwayman, and get a reward between 40 and and £100. Pounds. But for the normal individual, that was going to be quite difficult. And there was quite a number of gangs operating in the area. And there was a magistrate in this court here called Henry Fielding and he instigated the first professional police force. He only had six officers at the time but they were there to find the criminals and bring them directly to Bow Street Magistrate Court so that they could be given justice. He was able to show how effective this police force was because it cleared the gangs very quickly but he also set standards for all future police forces which would set the scenes for the Metropolitan Police Force, which would come later. So he got funding, he had a good clerical systems, he started forensics and had a process for both charging and going through the prosecution process. He also had a group of mounted police who went specifically after the highway robbers. And this was a crack police force so good that they were given their own names as well, called the 
Robin Redsbreasts, basically because of their red uniforms that they wore. Now, the interesting thing about a police station in Britain is you tend to see the blue light outside it to signify that it is a police station. But the Bow Street Magistrates was different, that it had a white light outside it. Because when Queen Victoria came to the theatre or came to the opera, she didn't like the blue light because that reminded her of Prince Albert, who had only very recently died. So there's a little piece of trivia for you. OK, so we're going to just go at the very side of this building here, uh, the Royal Opera House, just to finish the run, between the Floral Street and St James Junction. And we just go to the end, and once we come to the end, we just turn immediately right and the start of the next run outside Covent Garden Tube Station. OK, the last leg of this 4.6 kilometre photo run goes from Covent Garden to Trafalgar Square. It's the longer section, so it's about 1.9 kilometres. And again, it's always best to do this first thing in the morning. Now, the route we're going to take is that we're going to spend a little bit more time in Covent Garden exploring the area. And then when we come out of Covent Garden, we're going to go straight across into theatre land again, or this area of theatre land. And we start with the oldest theatre, the Theatre Royal, Jury Lane. And then we go down into the Aldridge, go past Somerset House, and then we're onto the Strand. And then we go straight along the Strand, past Waterloo Bridge, all the way down to Charing Cross Station, where we do a little dog leg at the side of St. Martin's in the Field, and then we'll be in Trafalgar Square by the National Gallery, and then we'll turn down past Nelson's Column, and we'll go and finish up at the Tube Station. But again, as before, we're going to do this at speed, and the start position of this one is to be on James's Street, which is, or just looking at James's Street, from Long Acre, with the tube station on our left-hand side, and we're just going to continue down down there. So as we go down James's Street, we just pass the Royal Opera House on our left-hand side, which we just come out of, basically. And then when we get to the bottom, where the telephone box is, we're going to turn right by the Apple Store, and then go around into the plaza itself of Covent Garden. We've got St Paul's Church on our right and then we go through in this particular video we're actually going to go through Old Covent Garden Market but we can go around the side it really depends on the amount of people who are there and then when we get to the end we really just want to go right if we've gone through it but we want to end up just outside the London Transport Museum and then we come back and we're just going to go out through Russell Street straight across on the Catherine Street past the Theatre Royal Jury Lane and then We've got a number of other theatres coming up on our left and right hand side. We've got the Duchess Theatre, Novello Theatre. And then we go left past Wardorf Hotel and then right. And you'll see that there's a little gap between uh, India House and we go down these small little sets of stairs. And then right in front of us we'll have Somerset House. When we get there, we turn right and we come uh, along the road in here past the me Hotel in the Aldridge. We cross over that with Waterloo Bridge on our left-hand side and then we're in the Strand and we keep on going down there. We have the Strand Palace Hotel on our right-hand side uh, with Simpsons the Strand on our left and then we've got the Savoy with the Savoy Theatre which we've just gone into and out of. Directly across the road is Covent Garden so that gives you an idea about where we are in relation to everywhere else. And then we have the Vaudeville Theatre and the Delphi Theatre on our right-hand side. And then we've got the Royal Society of Arts just in that little alleyway you just saw there. And then we're coming to Zimbabwe House. And then we've just got the Courts Bank on our right. And then we've got Charing Cross Station on our left and Hotel. And then just as we get to this junction, we're just going down to Duncannon Street with St. Martin's and Field on our right-hand side. And then we get to the end of this road, we're going to be in Trafalgar Square. Then we have the National Gallery on our right-hand side, and we turn left, then we're into Trafalgar Square. 
with the fountains and we have Nelson's column right in front of us and then we go round the side of that and we're just heading off to the island just be careful here with the traffic but we just want to go to the traffic island just because that's going to give you right in the centre of London so with by the King Charles Island go around that with Admiral Arch in front of you and then cross the road and we're just going to end up at the underground station here so that's the route now we're going to go on a guided tour of the key sites from Covent Garden to Trafalgar Square so having a look at this last leg of this 4.6 photo run we're just outside Covent Garden tube station as you can see here we're just going to look quick look at the historical makeup of this area if we come and look at the 1549 map you can see that the route that we would have taken then would have been again in within Covent Garden just gone across the orchards and then ended up along the Strand through, through some people's gardens and then taken us all the way down to Trafalgar Square. So the last part of the run would be as is today in terms of the actual geographic route that we take. But the first part would be not there at all. So you can see it has changed quite a bit. And then we can move a little bit more to 1680 and this will sort of show us Again, a map that we, we saw before, but you can see how well it's been built up following the time when the Earl of Bedford had developed the area, again, at the time of Henry VIII came in over the land. So this is how it looked at that particular period. And the interesting thing you can see if you follow the red line in here, you can see that Covent Garden had been fully formed. It was initially developed in 1686, um, after the Duke of Bedford managed to get, in a sense, planning permission to plan in this part and get rid of the three-mile exclusion zone that was going around London to protect the city of London from the plague. So he developed it for high-class living. So he built a huge house called Bedford House, really down towards, it's not really shown on here, but towards uh, Henrietta Street was where the Bedford House was placed. It was a plaza built on the Italian style and the layout has remained very much the, the same. So King Street, where we came down from the previous run, is still here, um, as in Henrietta Street, and we can see the church in front. Now, the plaza would have been blank at this particular point. And you can see the main sites where the Transport Museum is today and the Royal Opera House is today and the tube stations are. And as we would come out from here, you can see the main road where the theatre is located is still there um, it's only when we get down to the Aldridge area that it does change and then we can see the strand coming along towards the end now if we look at this about how that might have changed by the time we get to 1850 so we're now in that was Stuart's time this is Victorian's era uh, we'll see that again not a great deal has changed from that 18. 60s map so in terms of the main street coming down the plaza is still there the route layout is very similar still haven't developed the Aldridge at this point but the buildings have been upgraded so be, it would look really quite new at this particular point in some areas Covent Garden as a market would have been established and other things that have been pretty new at the time would have been Trafalgar Square in the embankment would not have been built but we've also got a new bridge down here near Hungerford Market which was a new suspension bridge. So this is a market to compete with the Covent Garden market at the time. Okay, so that's about the main sort of history. Let's keep on going. So the first port of call we're going to stop at is at the bottom of James' Street, next to the telephone boxes, next to the Apple Store, and then we have the Covent Garden structure we see in front of us here. Now there's a couple of pictures we've got on here, one from 1720, that we can see that St Paul's Church in its form there big open space but all the people here are actually going to the opera so you can see opera was still a big part uh, even at this area of London uh, the other map we show is in 1820 and this is just before they built what you can see today so this would be in the old market with the old market buildings and the building that you see in front of you dates from 1870 Charles Fowler was responsible for this but he also did the Floral Hall by the Transport Museum, which we'll see shortly. Now there's 
two floors to this building. Well, actually three if you actually go to the top level and the, the middle as well as a ground floor. It was a fruit and veg and flower market and it remained like that until 1974 when it was moved to Nine Elms. But luckily they managed to get a preservation order on it so it wasn't demolished and in 1980 it reopened and it has gone from strength to strength. Now if we just go around the, the front of the building to St Paul's Church, this church is quite interesting for many reasons. It dates back from 1630 from the time when Indigo Jones was responsible for building it. It was one of the first churches to be built after the Reformation, in other words where we detached ourselves from the Catholic Church. But at the time it wasn't the parish church of the area. That took a number of years for it to come together. And in fact, 1645 was when it became St. Paul's. This almost has like a false front, so this looks like the front of the church, but the main entrance is the other side. And this church is also known as the Actors' Church. So we're going to continue down to the Transport Museum. As I said, you can either go through the building and see the different levels and explore the area, or you can go around the outside and then turn left, go past the ivy, and then you'll be at the Transport Museum, which we'll see here. The Transport Museum is in the Floral Hall, and it's been there since about 1980. Originally, the Transport Museum was in Acton, and it's also been revamped in 2007 and includes more transportation, both tubes and buses. Also has a Jubilee Market, which has been there since about 1904. But today there's a lot of stalls selling clothes and other items. So we're just going to turn around and we're going to end up at the junction of Bow Street and Russell Street. But we're just going to go straight on into the theatre land of this part of London. So the first thing I'm going to draw your attention to as we cross the road, well, there's a couple of things. Just before we cross the road, there is, in fact, the Bond in Motion Museum nearby here, which is also worth a visit if you do like to see all the James Bond's cars. It's very entertaining. It's one of my favourite areas of London, so two areas of transport all in one. But we're going to go to theatre now, so just across the road in here, and head towards the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, which was the first theatre built by Charles II, the king who brought back partying, and he had his own company called the King's Company and the Duke's Company who performed in this particular theatre. This theatre currently dates from 1812 and is now run by Andrew Lloyd Webber. There's a number of different theatres, just so you can just get an idea. We have the Fortune Theatre, which is just before you get to the Theatre Royal, which was built in 1924. We have the Novello Theatre, which is just here on our left-hand side. We have the Duchess Theatre. We have the Lyceum, which is over to the right, more by Waterloo Bridge. And then we're going to go around the corner and see the Aldridge Theatre. So again, quite a large number of theatres to cater for the growing population of London at the time. Now what we're going to do is when we get to the end, we're going to be in the Aldridge area. Now there's some interesting things about the Aldridge. Now the Aldridge is a relatively new part of London. It's the eastern border, so we have the law courts going towards the east and then we've just got the west end of London starting at this particular point. So it was developed in 1905, again another slum clearance area, but its history does date back to the Anglo-Saxon times. Today you can see it's quite a grand semicircular road and it has one ex-tube station, three hotels, the Waldorf, the Mee Hotel and number one Aldridge. It has a massive ex-public building or still public building called Somerset House which is well worth a visit. It has two high commissions, the India House and Australia House, two new universities, the LSE and King's College, two churches, St Clement's Danes from Oranges and Lemons and Mary Lestrand, two theatres, Novella and Aldridge, two television centres or ex-television centres. One was Bush House for the World Service and also had ITN Television News. So all that in one place and you wouldn't necessarily notice going around it. 
and then there's the whole law courts towards the east. So the new road, when it was put in, improved traffic, it improved access going north. Again, it gentrified the area. And a couple of things to note is that on our left-hand side, we have the Waldorf Hotel, which was built in 1908 by William Waldorf Astor. And it is known for two things. One is for the tea dances that used to be in the Palm Court, and the others from the Waldorf salad from the Forty Tower sketch, which is a British comedy, so it may not, not everyone will get that. As we move across, we go between the India House, we go through India Place, and then we're looking directly at Somerset House. Now, there's several views from Somerset. This is the main entrance, obviously, because the more majestic entrance can be seen from the other side of the Thames. As you go through the entrance, you'll see that there's the Courtauld Institute of Arts, often just referred to as the Courtauld. This was developed in 1932 and is a self-governing college of the University of London that looks after the history of art and conservation. However, it does have the Courtauld Gallery, which tends to focus on French Impressionist and post-Impressionist art and is well worth a visit. Now, in terms of it being built, again, Another similar story in this part of London. Again, the Reformation, Henry VIII's son this time, Edward IV, gave this to the Duke of Somerset. Now, it was a very turbulent time, so when you were in with the king, sometimes it was short-lived, literally. And the same thing happened to the Duke of Somerset, because in 1552, he was arrested and executed for crimes against the crown so they took the property back from him after he built it and it became a crown property for many years and in fact became a royal palace for some time but like a lot of things it eventually fell into decline in the 1700s however the government then took it over and converted it to the first public building or public offices and that included offices for the stamp office the tax office and the naval offices it was also the place where all the birth and death certificates were kept until the 1970s. Today it's uh, open to the public, there's lots of exhibitions and there's a great open space where there's fountains in the summer, there's ice skating in the winter and there's cafes and lots of things going on in the area. Now if we turn back we'll see that we have a church in front of us and that is called St Mary's Le Strand and as you see it actually in the Strand so not many churches have that as a architectural feature but this was one of the 12 new churches that was built specifically in 1714 for London's expanding population. Now if we look in this general direction you'll see that we've got King's College on our right hand side built in 1826 but over the other side we'd have to go back to where we just come from to the other side of the semicircle near Australia House to where the London School of Economics resides called the LSC and that was built in 1895. This has had 16 Nobel Prize winners but has also had a pop legend in the name of Mick Jagger who was there for a year before he got more involved with the Rolling Stones. Now, As we get to the end of the Aldridge we'll be at the junction of Waterloo Bridge and again you get some views of Somerset House from here and if we look across the road we've got number one Aldridge and we've also got the Mee Hotel in front of us and then we've also got the Lyceum to the right hand side and a traditional British pub right at the corner there so every so something for everyone but if we look across the road we can see that we've got Waterloo Bridge now there's some interesting things just about this bridge it was built in 1817 so that's two years after the Battle of Waterloo. So it was originally going to be called the Strand Bridge, but due to the battle, it was then called Waterloo Bridge. Now, 50 years later, when they built the embankment, that had the effect of speeding up the river, but it also had the effect of speeding up the erosion of the riverbanks. So by the time you got to 1930s, this bridge was getting pretty unstable. And therefore, in 1935, they decided to build a new bridge. But then came the Second World War, And this was the only real bridge to be hit by a bomb. The repair of the bridge at the time was 
mainly repaired and built by women, so this is sometimes called the Ladies' Bridge. Now, before we go down towards the Strand, if we just look at the, the Me Hotel and the building opposite, and I just pop up this old picture of what it used to look like before, you can see that there are some similarities, but you can see that the building on our left used to be the Morning Post. The Me Hotel used to be the Gaiety Theatre. The Waldorf Hotel is obviously still, still there, but the novella was called The Strand. Now we're going to go along the Strand. Now the Strand is one of the oldest roads in London. It connects the city of London with the palaces at Westminster. And it used to have massive houses on there. So if we just go through the list of houses from the other side of the Aldridge to the, towards the east. There was Essex House, there was Arundel's House, there was Somerset House, which we've just seen in here. There was Savoy Palace, there was Durham House, there was Cecil House, York House, Hungerford and Northumberland House. So these were all big houses that faced the river. Their frontage was onto the riverside and this was the elite of London and the aristocracy. However, the other side of the road would have been reserved for taverns, coffee houses, restaurants, as well as theatre for entertainment. Because as everything, when you have a rich centre, there is always other entertainment industries that spring up nearby. 150 years later, John of Gaunt was resident and he was the father of Henry Bolingbroke, who would become Henry IV, but only after he usurped the existing king, Richard II, in 1400 which then went off to the war between the house of lancaster and the house of york about who should be the king of england and all its domains and that lasted all the way up until the tudors to henry the seventh in 1485 in the 1500s henry the made it a hospital and then it became a barracks but eventually burnt down in 1864 but when the embankment was built in 1870, that just gave the area a lot more chance for redevelopment. And Richard Doyley Carp, from the profits he'd made from the Gilbert and Sullivan plays, decided that he would build the Savoy Theatre and the Savoy Hotel. And this opened in 1889, and it was one of the first hotels in the area to have electric lights and lifts. He also brought in Caesar Ritz to not only set a high level of cuisine but also a superb level of service which we see still today a couple of things to, to spotlight here we see the royal society of arts manufacturing and commerce just tucked away in saint adam street this has been here since 1754 and and interestingly the patron is the queen and the president is the princess royal now as we get towards the end of the tour we're just going to bear off by Charing Cross station. Charing Cross was built on the site of Hungerford Market in 1860 so it's the nearest station to the centre of London. In fact it's only about 100 yards from the centre of London and it was built by Charles Barry who also built the Houses of Parliament. Now you'll see a lot of the stations that we have in London have a fantastic frontage and the station is all behind it but we'll talk a little bit more about Charing Cross Station in another video. We're just going to stop at two other locations before we finish. One is St Martin's in the Field Church and there's been a church I think since about 410 AD but this church dates back from the 13th century. The current building is around 1726 and that was built by James Gibb. There is a crypt underneath it and they used to have the crypt as a way of earning more money for the church so you could bury it underneath the church. But today, although the church still has religious services, the crypt is both a tea rooms and a music room for jazz. St Martin's in the Field is also a parish church for Buckingham Palace, Downing Street, the Admiralty and also the Chinese congregation in Chinatown or those Christians within that community. And it also does a lot of work for the homeless. So finishing off now, we end up at Trafalgar Square. Again, we look at this in much more detail in another tour. But before this was built, it was the site of the Royal Mews. It would house the horses, the falcons, the greyhounds, all the animals for hunting, as well as the carriages. 
So when we look at the square, the Battle of Trafalgar took place in 1805, but Nelson's column was eventually put up in 1843. But the area's been under development for a number of years. So you had the National Gallery there since 1824, and then you've had Canada House in its present position in 1827, but that was from the Royal College of Physicians and a Union Club before it became Canada House in 1925. Then there was South Africa House, which was a Morley Hotel, which was built in 1934. Now, if we have a look across the road where Northumberland Avenue was, there would have been a huge building there called Northumbrian House. But when they built the embankment, they demolished that to make way for the road. And that was built in 1870. So the area is still owned by the Queen, because it still was the Royal Muse, and and it is very close to the centre of London. And you get that by going to King Charles Island, and you'll see a little plaque in there to signify where the centre of London is. And again, I'll come back to that in more detail in another video. So I hope you have enjoyed this 4.6 kilometre photo run. There's lots of other runs to do within the area. Um, this is the start of the whole of the sightseeing runs, or one part of them. And I hope to see you in another video. Thank you.